to postpone your funeral, what should we do? We should pray. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Father, I ask you right now, you will give us all of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you will impart to us wisdom and knowledge. Help us, Lord, to understand your word on this subject of how we can postpone our funeral, Lord. We know that death is a sure thing. We all must die. That's one, one thing that will happen. We all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. But God, we know that we can postpone that funeral according to your word, and we're going to learn that tonight. Father, as we study this subject, please help us, Lord, not only to have understanding, but to take this understanding and apply it to our life, that we will not only be hearers of your word, but that we will be doers of your word as well. We thank you and we love you and we ask you all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. How to postpone your funeral. How many of you would like to know how to postpone your funeral tonight? Some people say, well, I'm ready to leave this old world. I don't care anymore. I don't want to stay here any longer. Well, you know what? That may be the case, but keep in mind, Jesus has created all of us, and you are still breathing life for a reason. Can you say amen? You are breathing His breath for a reason, friends. And if you're still alive, that means God is not done with you yet. He has a great purpose upon your life. And so, friends, a lot of people are confused on, on, on God's, and God's understanding and His relation to us, not only in a spiritual context, but in a physical context as well. And so, we've been learning as we go through this Bible Prophecy Seminar about the three angels' messages. Isn't that right? We've been learning about these three angels that ha have these messages that are going to all of the world, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, indicating that these messages are very, very important, very, very imperative for us to know. We read about these messages in Revelation 14, beginning in verse 6. It says, And I saw another angel fly where? In the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell where? On the earth. It says, To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So this is going again to all of the world. It says, Saying with a whimper. Not no whimper, right? With a loud voice. So this is a loud message that God wants the whole world to hear. Here's the message. Fear God. Now, is that we've already learned that's not a, ooh, be scared of God, right? Because God is love, and we shouldn't be, ooh, scared of love, right? We, we talked about that word fear. That means a reverential awe, a reverential respect for God. And no doubt, we should respect our God that died on Calvary's cross. It says, and give glory to who? To Him. Notice that's the underlying portion tonight. It says, for the hour of His judgment is come. So now this is serious time that we're living in. Judgment has come upon us. We see that in the Word of God. And it says, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now we've talked about that last part there, about getting back to worshiping the Creator. And we're going to be talking about that more on throughout this uh, evangelistic series. But we know here that the, the underlying portion that we need to understand is how do we give glory to God? Now, no doubt about it, if we were to go on a street corner and interview about a hundred different people, we could find a hundred different people that would give probably some pretty decent, good answers about how, what ways we could give glory to God. Some people would probably say, well, we sing praises to God. And some people would probably say, well, we give glory to God in ways of studying His Word and, and coming together in prayer. And absolutely, I think those are great answers. But there's certain answers that we already know. But there's certain contexts of, of, uh, of this uh, co question that we have, of how do we give glory to God, that a lot of people, excuse me, <laughs> I felt that building up, <laughs> that a lot of people don't talk about, which is, how do we really give glory to God according to God's Word? Well, there's a scripture in the Bible that I think, in my opinion, that a lot of people overlook and that a lot of people don't really consider in their Christian walk. And that is 1 Corinthians 10 and 31. It says this, Whether therefore you what? Eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. You say, have mercy, Dakota. You've underlined eating and you've underlined drinking. You've quit preaching and you've done went to meddling. But friends, I want to tell you something. If the Word of God talks about something, we should talk about it too. Amen? We should consider it as well. Now, keep in mind, this scripture is saying, whether you eat or whether you drink, do it all to the glory of God. Now, now, i got a question. Is this verse indicating that you can eat and drink to the glory of God, yes or no? I'm going to sit down over here and wait for you guys to wake up a moment. I'm just going to... i got all night. Yes or no? Amen, yes. So, we know this is indicating that you can eat and drink to the glory of who? 
God. Now, if it's indicating that you can eat and drink to the glory of God, then by direct contrast to that, that means it's also indicating that you can eat and drink that is not to the glory of God. Isn't that right? So, if you can eat and drink to the glory of God, well, that's simple. That means you can also eat and drink that is not to the glory of God. Now, a lot of people, they, 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 well, you start talking on these manners, they go, oh, now come on now. And see, what we do in our lives sometimes, we have all these doors in our lives. All these different doors and all these different places. And we say, God, you can have, you can, you can have the keys. Here's a key to that door, and here's a key to that door, and that door. And a few doors you just stay out of. I don't want you in any parts of these doors because that's my business. But friends, God is not, inter- he's not, he's not just interested in 95% of you. Can you say Amen. He is interested in 100% of you. He didn't die to save 95% of you. He died to save all of you. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. So, friends, if we can eat and drink to the glory of God, again, that means we can also eat and drink that is not to the glory of God. And Revelation, the message in the last days, is calling us all to fear God, respect Him, reverence Him, and give glory to Him in every way. Now... Let me ask this next question. This is a very common here. Is God interested in our physical health? Yes or no? Amen. Yes. Amen. Now, now, we say that with such conviction here, because probably many of you have already heard this message before. But maybe some of you are sitting out here and you haven't heard this message before. Here's something we need to consider. Is that what did Jesus spend, spend the majority of His time doing in the ministry? Healing, that's right. He spent the majority of his time in his three and a half years of ministry going about healing people, amen, from different physical ailments, different physical ills, and different physical problems that they had in their life. So Jesus is certainly interested in our physical health. But see, there is a lie of the devil that is such a deceptive lie, and it's leading a lot of people down a world uh, into a trap of sin. And what it's doing is that this lie is saying this. This lie is saying that God is not interested in your physical well-being because the the outward man, he just perishes. He's only interested in the inward man. He's only interested in your spiritual well-being. But friends, that is a lie. God, yes, God is interested in your your spiritual well-being, amen? But He is also equally interested in your physical well-being. And so many people try to demote the character of Christ to something to be like he's only interested in your in your physical or in your spiritual well-being. He only cares about what happens on the inside. He don't care about what happens on the outside. Friends, let me tell you something. Jesus cares about every bit of you. Amen. Every bit of you. There is not one part that Jesus does not care about, and he's interested in our physical health. Now, look at what Third John, in verse two, says. He says, "Beloved." I wish above how many things? All things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Can you say amen? God is telling us here in this verse, I am not just interested in your spiritual health, your spiritual well-being. I am also interested in your physical health and your physical well-being. Now, I have a question here on the screen that I want us all to pay attention to. According to God, what is our bodies the temple of? The Holy Spirit, right? We know the Word of God. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. He says, What? Know ye not that your body... Now, what's our body? It's it's this vessel here, right? No doubt about it. It's who we are. It's our body, right? That your body is the temple of the Holy... What? Of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Now, notice what it's saying here, that you and I are not our own. I hear people all throughout the world and all throughout my ministry as I travel. They tell me, they say, Dakota, it's my body. I'll do what I want with my body. Well, first of all, I'm not trying to tell anyone what to do with their body. Can you say amen? I'll let God's Word do that. Can you say amen? I'm not trying to meddle in anyone's business, but I am a minister of the everlasting gospel of Christ. And I have to preach it as it says it. I can't hold nothing back. Amen? And so check this out. Some people come to me and they say, it's my body. I'll do what I want to with it. Don't tell me what I can and cannot do because it's my body. Well, friends, the reality is it's not your body. And this body that I have is not my body. Can someone say amen? Amen. It says, you are not your own. It goes on to say in verse 20, for you are bought with a price. 
Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Can someone say amen? So friends, you and I are not our own. Why are we not our own? Because we were bought with a what? With a price. What price were we bought with? The blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, no doubt. So friends, here's the thing. Here's the thing I want to ask us all. If we're bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are not our own, then what do we really own? Nothing, can you say amen? But unless we do own one thing, there's just one little small thing we own. Guess what it is? It's our sin. Are you with me? It's our sin. You and I, we don't own anything but our sin. That car you drive, that's not your car, that's God's car. Amen? He created every element that that car is made up of. Every bit of that was His creation. No doubt about it. Man may have formed His creation into some kind of instrument, but nevertheless, everything that that car is made of is God's. The house that you sleep in every night, that you pay that mortgage on, that is not your house. That is God's house. The money in your bank account that you've been saving up for all of these years to purchase that big, nice house and the picket jacked up truck and the nice sports car, all of that is God's. Amen? It's all God's money, all God's material. You and I only own one thing, and that's our sin. But here's the good, here's the good news. You see, Jesus wants our sin too. Can you say amen? You see, how many of you like a good bargain? Oh, come on, folks. There you go, yeah. How many of you like going flea marketing? Woo! We're living in Arkansas. We love going flea marketing, don't we? Right? We see that nice little Ten Commandments, you know, sitting up there at that flea market on the little, on the little uh, picture format there. We go, ooh, he's got $5 on it. But I wonder, I wonder if I can get him down to two. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You want to try to get him down to two, right? And, and you like a good bargain. Well, Jesus has the bargain of a lifetime for you and I. He says, I tell you what, you give me all your surrender all of that to me and I will henceforth give you eternal life. Can someone say amen? Amen. That's a bargain of a lifetime. What do you say? We give Jesus our sin. He gives us eternal life. But friends, we're going to talk more about how we give our sin to Jesus. No doubt about it. We need a heart transformation. Amen. We need our minds to be transformed. We're going to talk more about that along the way. But Jesus has the bargain of a lifetime. He goes on to say here, and in 1 Corinthians 3.16, he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now here's a solemn warning given to all of us. We are the temple of whom? God. Now here's a solemn warning. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God, what? Destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. I got a question. Is this subject tonight serious, yes or no? This is talking about life and death, amen? That this is not just one of those informative subjects where we walk away and go, ooh, that was some good information that I, I plugged in my brain tonight. No, this is a very severe and serious subject that how we respond to this subject could mean life or death, amen? So friends, pay very close attention as we, as we study this subject and we go through this tonight. If we defile the temple of God, God will what? Destroy us. Amen? So we need to know if our body is the temple of God, we need to know how to run our body. Can someone say amen? We need to, let, we need to know how to run this system. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever heard someone say when someone dies, well, maybe it was their time to go? Anyone ever heard somebody say that? You know, like a 30-year-old dies, falls dead with a heart attack, or a 45-year-old man uh, has a tumor in his head, or whatever it may be. Just those crazy deaths, you know, and, and somebody dies, and they said, oh, well, it just must have been their time. Well, did you know that we can die before our time? It's possible for us to die before our time. Well, let's see what the Bible says on this subject. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 17 says, Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Friends, you and I can die before our time. We can do and make foolish mistakes, foolish decisions that can cause ourselves to die before we were supposed to go. Can you say amen? 
How many of you would think it would be very ignorant and very foolish to try to play Russian roulette? I think that would be a very foolish and ignorant thing. But some people, they think that's fun. And there's other lifestyle practices and other things that people do that they are playing Russian roulette without even realizing it. Amen? And we're going to talk about some of those lifestyle practices tonight. Now, I'm not trying to meddle and get in anyone's business. Matter of fact, I want to remind you that I have stayed out of your personal life. Can you say amen? I haven't been trying to, 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 to prog and pry and to get into any, anyone's personal life. I want to make that very clear. But we are going to talk about some destructive lifestyle practices that causes our health to degenerate. Can you say amen? Because keep in mind, this subject is very important. God says... To whoever defiles this temple, he will destroy. Should Christians be addicted to drugs? And that was a good time for you all together in unison to say, No! no. Should, let me, let's try it one more time. Should Christians be addicted to drugs? No. no. No doubt about it, right? We know that Christians should not be addicted to drugs. Now, there are many drugs that are very destructive to our bodies. Now... Some people, and, and I'm not trying to say that, you know, there's certain, you can't take medication, you can't take certain things. I'm not saying that. Don't misunderstand me. I'm talking about drugs and the concepts that you know exactly what I'm talking about. Abusing something to the point to where it's degenerate to your health, degenerate to your body. It's abusing things that even, are, are taking things that's not even needful for your body, that's not helpful to your body at all. Now, I just want to throw an example out there of this. An example of a destructive lifestyle practice would be cigarette smoking. Again, I don't know your personal life. You may be struggling with this yourself. You may not be struggling with this. I have no idea. It's not, it's not in my business. But I'm going to share with you some facts on some of this real quick. Every cigarette a person smokes takes 14.5 minutes off of their life, according to a, a study done by Dr. Linus Pauling. 14.5 minutes for every cigarette smoked. Now, I have loved ones and, and family members that are addicted to cigarettes that, man, they just can't seem to shake the addiction. Do this right here. Amen. Humble ourselves a little bit. Let's all, we're all addicted to something. You know, we like to point fingers and say, Oh, that brother and her sister there, boy, they can't put the bottle down. Or they can't do this. Or they can't do that. Let me tell you, we're all addicted to something. If you, don't think, if you think you're so heady and high-minded that you're not addicted to anything, go to God in prayer. Get alone with God in prayer. And I promise you, God will show you where you got some flaws in your life. Can you say, say amen? He will point those out to you. No doubt about it. And so... You know, I did the math on this. There's, there's, I think there's 20 cigarettes in a, in a box of cigarettes. You do the math, 20 times 14.5, and it ends up coming out to over 290 minutes, or 290 minutes off of your life. You add that in hours, that's 4.8 hours taken off of a person's life if they smoke one pack a day. 4.8 hours. Friends, that's... That's huge. Can you say amen? That is huge. That is 4.8 hours, about 5 hours taken off of a person's life every day for just smoking one pack of cigarettes a day. And there's a lot of people, there's millions in the world today that does that, that are addicted that bad to it. Friends, but we can shake any addiction. Can someone say amen? We can overcome any addiction. So there may be someone here tonight that's struggling with this. Guess what? You can overcome it in and through Jesus. No doubt about it. Moving on, you know, nicotine causes the arteries to shrink. And when the arteries get smaller and smaller, clots get caught in the blood vessels, and then a stroke or a heart attack happens. It soon follows. You know, I have many friends, um, many loved ones who have had this happen to them. They smoke, and, you know, their arteries are shrinking, their veins are shrinking, and before they know it, uh, their oxygen is depleted completely from their body. Their lungs are deteriorating, literally, to the point to where they can't function properly. They get either emphysema, some kind of cancer of the lungs, or they get some kind of blood disease. There's all kinds of issues, or a clot gets stuck in the brain or the heart and causes a stroke. Friends, so many different dangerous things can happen from forming some of these habits. Now, we as Christians, we know that these things are destructive. Can someone say amen? They're destructive to our health. Not only has science told us this, but uh, we can see it just by watching someone. You know, when you first smoke a cigarette... I've seen people that pick up a cigarette for the first time. And they pick it up and they inhale it one big old... <laughs> it doesn't sound like something that's healthy for you, amen? <laughs> so we can be very clear about some of these things in our lifestyle. But there's many other lifestyle practices that are, are destructive as well. 
you know, cigarettes is just one of those practices. You know, on the box of cigarettes, they actually warn you about carbon monoxide gas and breathing that in. It can actually kill you, you know, breathing that stuff in. All kinds of dangerous, dangerous substances from this, no doubt about it. But what about food? You say, oh, no, pastor, don't go to food. Don't start talking about my food. Oh, but let me tell you something. Food can be just as destructive, if not more destructive, than any drug out there in the world. Amen? Food can be very destructive. You know, food's something we all want more of, or we have to eat to live. I'll tell you, uh, one of the things I've always struggled with in my lifetime is that right there on the screen. Donuts. I have always liked donuts throughout my life. And even to this day, when I see a donut shop, it's hard for me to, to drive by without wanting to stop and get a, 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 a couple of donuts because they're just so delicious. <laughs> they're just so delicious. But friends, let me tell you, certain things can become so addictive that they become very, very unhealthy for you. And keep in mind, our body is the temple of what? The Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is abiding in our bodies, we need to make sure our bodies are clean and undefiled. Amen? So that the Holy Spirit can work on our minds and our hearts and help us to draw closer to Jesus, no doubt. What about sugar? Is sugar addictive? Amen, Amen right? Sugar is one of, let me tell you something about sugar. Sugar is probably one of the most addictive drugs in all the world. Amen. And you say, did you just call sugar a drug? I did. Because it's one of the most addictive substances in all the world. Here's the thing. They did a study on this to show how addictive sugar really is. And I'm not saying it's a sin if you take in any sugar or any of that. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm just using an example here of how things can be destructive to our health if consumed. You see, scientists did a study on uh, Oreo cookies with rats. What they did, they took these little rats and they put one rat inside a, a box by itself. And they took another rat and they put him inside a box by itself. And they fed one rat crack cocaine, a very addictive drug. And they fed the other rat Oreo cookies. And what they did is that they monitored these two rats' as brain patterns, showing how their brains how their brains work. And what happened is that when it came time to take that substance from them, to take the cookies and the crack cocaine from them, they were monitoring their brain patterns. This was a study, I think, done back in 2013 or 2010, somewhere around that time period. And they monitored their brain patterns, and they saw the withdrawal effects are worse upon the rat that did not have the Oreo cookies than the rat that did not have his crack cocaine. That the rat that didn't have his Oreo cookies, he was going psychotic. He was losing his mind. He was having all kinds of issues going on with his brain. And the rat that was on the crack cocaine, yeah, he was having some bad fits too, but not near as bad as the one that was addicted to sugar, addicted to that Oreo cookie. You know, it's interesting. Anything can become dangerous and addictive to our life, friends, if we allow it to. Amen? We need to be careful of how much we consume of something, no doubt about it. And there's some things that are outright forbidden in God's Word. Amen? We're going to talk about some of those things too. What is God's biblical diet plan? Does God have a biblical diet plan, yes or no? I think He does in the Bible. And friends, I'm going to share that with you tonight. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29, we read this. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Friends, this was God's original plan in Eden before there was any sin. Can someone say amen? This was God's original diet plan. And I want to submit to you that when we get back to heaven, we're going to be following that original diet plan. Can someone say amen? amen. Now, after sin, after the fall, we know that different things was involved where they would work amongst the, the, uh, the field and they would, they would labor amongst the field to produce uh, different uh, things from the field. We see this, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. It was ever to plant an apple tree. Do you have to keep planting an apple tree every year for apples to grow on that tree? No, but what about with like different substances such as like vegetables, for instance? Do you yes, they die. And it was a symbol, again, of how death was added when, when Adam and Eve sinned, fallen from the, the tree. God's original plan was to replenish. Can you say amen? And, and so... We see that this concept was added in. Now, don't get me wrong. We should still eat our fruits and our vegetables. Amen? This is part of God's more healthful and original plan added to His life of how we should eat and how we should participate and practice in our lifestyle. Let me ask you a question. Did death exist before sin? 
It did not exist before sin, did it not? Uh, could, how many of you remember, you know, uh, how many of you could imagine, rather, could you imagine Adam and Eve? They're in the Garden of Eden with their bow and their arrows. And they're looking at that wild boar. And they're creeping up on the wild boar. And they pull back and they shoot it. And that wild boar goes squilling and blood's flying everywhere. And it's just an awful mess. How many of you could imagine that in the Garden of Eden? No, right? There was no death at all in the Garden of Eden. Amen? No death whatsoever, friends. And so, you know, that actually animals and consuming animal flesh was not added until after the flood. Did you know that? It was only after the flood that God gave human beings permission to eat meat and to eat of the animals. Now, why do you think that was so? There wasn't anything to eat, was there, Brother West, on the earth? The vegetation, everything had been destroyed by the flood. Everything had been destroyed for 40 days and 40 nights. And so when they got back and they landed, they would have had to have something to eat. Can you say amen? They would have had to have something, and God understood this. So look at what God done in Genesis chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Verse 2. Of every clean beast, notice what he said there, every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by how many? Sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by how many? Two, the male and his female. It says, of the clean beast, and of the beasts that are not clean, and of the fowls of the air, and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. So God told, Adam, or God told Noah and them that, that there would be seven of the clean beasts upon the ark, but that the, that the unclean beast would go in by how many? By twos. Now, why do you think that was the reason for that? Well, he didn't want as many unclean, but necessarily, too, I imagine some of those clean beasts were probably going to be eaten. Isn't that right? And they needed to have more to replenish, no doubt about it. So check this out. Clean and unclean animals were established pre-Jewish. Now, the reason why I put this on the screen is because I have a lot of people that come to me and they say... Brother Day, we got, we got a problem with what you're teaching. You see, the clean and unclean principle in God's Word was only for the Jews. But i got a question. How many Jews were there in Noah's day? Zero. It was the antediluvian time period before there ever was a Jew ever recorded in the Bible. So, the clean and unclean principle is not just for the Jews. It's for everyone. Can you say amen? It's for everyone. God established this principle in Leviticus chapter 11, beginning in verse 46. He called it, this is the law of the beast. So this is a law that he established called the law of the beast. He goes on to say here, and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth. I notice he already established in Genesis, way before Moses' time, the clean and unclean principle. Now he's giving out a law about the beast that should be eaten and the beast that not should be eaten. He says, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, the beast, uh, between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. So check this out. And beginning in Leviticus 11 and verse 2, it says this. Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which you shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the what? Hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall you what? That shall you eat. So they have to have two things. They have to have a parted hoof, and they have to do what? Chew the cud, no doubt about it. Now, go, he goes on to say this in verse 4. Nevertheless, these shall you not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel. Because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is what? Unclean to you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is what? unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is what? Unclean to you. He says, Of their flesh shall you not eat, and their carcass shall you not touch. They are unclean to you. Now i got a question tonight. Be honest. How many of us are Bible Christians in here? You say, I believe all the Bible. Raise your hand high and proud. Amen. We're Bible Christians in here. So if we're Bible Christians... We need to follow the Bible. Amen? Not our own feelings, not our own ideologies, not our own opinions, but the Word of God. No doubt about it. And friends, that's all I'm sharing with you tonight. The Word of God. I am commanded to point you to the Word. 
And it's your decision to choose what you want to do, whether to obey it or to disobey it. So we're going to look at the list of clean meats here given in the Bible. Just an example. Yeah, the ox, the sheep, the deer, the goat, the wild goat, the antelope, the cows, the gazelle. Now here's a list of unclean meats. You have the camel, the rabbit, the swine, the rock badger. <laughs> How many of you couldn't wait to go home tonight and get you some good old Arkansas rock badger? Anyone? <laughs> we don't need no rock badger around here, do we? But out of all of these, which is probably the most problematic? Swine. No doubt about it. Swine in our society is probably the most problematic. You know, swine are, they're, they're a filthy animal. Pigs are some filthy animals, aren't they not? Are they not? Very filthy. I don't know why anybody would let their child do this with a pig. That is, ooh, ooh. there's no way I'd want to let my child uh, have a kissy kiss with a pig. Something as filthy as that, no doubt about it. You know, in the Newsweek, September 6, in 1999, we read this. It says, a few years ago, one nutritionist said bacon wasn't technically a meat anymore. It didn't belong to any food group at all. It was a salty, nitrate-ridden, fat-laden, carcinogenic thing. Yum. Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> and to some of us, though, we don't really realize the, the significance of eating something such as bacon. I had a friend of mine, he went to a, um, he went to a restaurant, and I think it was a Perkins or somewhere, one of those breakfast joints, and he ordered uh, some bacon. And he gets his bacon, and his bacon had some of the very private parts of the pig on it. He said, what in the world is this? And, and they said, well, that's what it is. They just cut it right off the belly of the, uh, uh, of the pig. You didn't know that? He said, I don't want this. He said, well, sir, that's what you're eating every time you eat bacon. He said, it's just the belly of the pig. And friends, if you think about it, I mean, it's kind of disgusting when you really think about it, isn't it? You're just cutting flesh off of an animal and frying it on your, on your pan. You know, some of these things we can be smart and intelligent about in saying that it's actually not healthy. You know, a lot of the animals in the world are put here as garbage collectors, and we'll talk about that in a, mo in a moment, in a, in a minute. They were put here to consume all the diseases, all the unclean animals. God calls them unclean for a reason. They were put here, their bodies were put here to consume a lot of the diseases that existed in the world to protect you and I from those diseases. You think of the fowl of the air. What does the fowl of the air do? Right? You see that dead animal, that armadillo on the side of the road that got smushed to pieces last night, and here come the fowl of the air, right? They're swarming, and then here you come zooming by, and they all, they all scatter like a, like, like a herd of hyenas or something. And they fly around, and then they fly in one big circle, they come back, and they're there, they're eating, they're taking care of that, that food. They're eating that diseased carcass up so it doesn't spread and become harmful to you and I. And so if they're eating diseases, what sense would it make for us to go and eat what they eat them when they're eating and consuming something diseased? What sense does that make? Is that going to be harmful to us if we do that? Of course it would, no doubt about it. How many of you are familiar with how, how hot dogs and bologna and all that's made? Anyone ever seen that? This is a factory where they actually make hot dogs and bologna and all these different substances that we eat so much of in our lifetime. I'll tell you, friends, this is absolutely disgusting. What, what they do is that they take the whole pig, its body, everything, they, they clean out its insides and different things like that and try to embalm the pig. And then they, they take this pig in this big, this big like conveyor belt and they all fall in this huge grinder, head and everything's in there. They're, I mean, everything, hoofs, whole nine yards. They throw them in this big grinder and they grind them up into little pieces until they come mush, basically. And they have all these spices and all these chemicals that they pour in with this to try to cleanse this meat that's diseased and carcass meat that's dead. And many of them have been dead for a long time before they get there to the factories. And, and they throw them in this and they pour all of these chemicals in there to try to make it sanitary for consumption. And they throw in the, the, the salt and the pepper and all these different things to season it so that it can mask the oil. And... All of this, and then what they do is that they shoot it after it's grinded up and mixed and all this, and they shoot it out this pipe into this big, huge, I guess you could say, pan. And all these people, all these workers back here, they're making sure that everything's flowing and working right, and then they're, they're basically they're placed into these casings where they're then led by a conveyor belt into a, uh, an oven where they all are cooked as they move through this oven real slowly. They come out the other end, and then they get cut off, the, the little, whatever you call it, the little twine that they're all connected to. 
They get shot out to be packaged, and then you and I eat them in the grocery store. We find them. It's just that's what we what, what we do. That's part of our lifestyle in society. But how many of you would love to go right up in with a big old spoon, right, and just dip it down in that? And I, anyone? No, right? That's disgusting, friends. I were talking about everything of this animal has been put inside this with different colorings to mask the blood and different things that did end up in there and pus and all these different things. It, they are legally allowed to allow all of these different chemicals in there to make it consumable for you and I. And I spent a large majority of my life eating these things, I'm telling you. I spent the majority of my life eating these kind of things. I would come home from school and I would grab one of those, one of those uh, hot dog you know, wieners that you would see and, I, and I'd just eat it. That's, I, I, that's what I was just part of my food. I'd get home from school. I had no idea that what, what was really put within that. And by the way, it's not just pig meat that's put in there. They mix it with chicken. They mix it with beef. And a lot of them, friends, in these factories, they're the chief, they're the, they're the chicken rather than chief. They're the chicken and the beef and, the, and all of this that, that nobody would normally eat themselves. They throw it all in this one big grinder, grind it out. You don't believe me, go and look at a hot dog package next time you go to the store. And check it out. You'll see chicken, beef, and pork on the label. And it's all in one little hot dog. How do they get chicken, beef, and pork all in one hot dog? We're going to talk about that in a moment. We're going to cover that. But friends, the, the pigs and the swine of this, they're, they're the garbage collectors. They're the garbage collectors. Let me give you a good example. You see, let's say that you owned a farm or a ranch, and your pig, your pig, your uh, your 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 uh, your pig, or uh, you have you, you have pigs. Let's just say that you have pigs on your ranch. You have a dog, and your dog he runs out in the front yard and he relieves himself in the front yard and drops a number two. As dogs normally do, now here comes the flies. The flies are swarming, and they're eating, and they're feasting, and then here comes a frog hopping out of the bushes, and he eats one of those flies. Then that frog hops back over the bushes, and a snake eats that frog. And now the snake slithers over into your pig pen, and then your pig eats that snake, because a pig will eat anything. And then a few days later, you come out, and you kill the pig, and you eat the pig. Now you know where you should have began your meal. You should have just started right in your front yard where your dog had left his number two there. Amen? <laughs> There's an old saying that says, you are what you eat. Isn't that right? Friends, let me tell you something. That's very true. If you're eating something diseased, you will partake of those diseases. You know, pigs, that you can actually study their whole digestional tract and everything. God made these animals so that all these unclean animals, they made their whole system so that they could inhabit the diseased things of the world, so they could take care of them. And when you eat their flesh and you eat their, their, the parts of their body, you can even become diseased just as they become diseased. Because people think they can cook out everything. You can't always cook out everything. There was a man I saw. He owned, and I have several family members that have went through this. He owned a, a, um, a pork restaurant where he served pork all the time. And I'll never forget, this gentleman, he, um, he ended up getting, having a heart attack. And they found out why he had a heart attack. The li the, there was actually living trachina larva inside the, and tapeworms inside this pigs, these pigs that he was eating in their meat. They were inside the meat. And he, he was eating it all the time because that's the restaurant he owned. And all, everyone there that worked at the restaurant, they'd eat it all the time. Well, he ate it the majority of his life. And before he knew it, a six-foot tapeworm got wrapped around this man's heart and caused him an absolute heart attack. A six-foot tapeworm. The doctor opened his heart, opened his chest up. They're in there performing the surgery, and they go, And they're looking at one another like, what? You can actually look up videos to this. I'm not joking. It's a real situation, friends. No doubt about it. God's Word is warning us about these things, friends, because if we partake of something that is unclean or unhealthy, it can affect our minds and how we think. Let me ask you a question. How does God communicate to us? Through our mind, amen? God communicates with us through our mind. So if what... Did you know something? Let me share something with you. What we put in our mouth affects our, or what we put in our stomach, rather, I said that backwards, what we put in our stomach affects our mind. 
And what we put into our mind can even affect our stomach. I remember some years ago there was a, a television show that came out called Fear Factor. Anyone ever saw that show, television show? One person, two people, three people, okay. Thank you guys for being honest. You, the rest of you out there may have saw that show. It's okay, I understand. No doubt about it, though, Fear Factor was this show. I remember watching it as a kid. And uh, there's just, it was just this contestant show. And what they had, they had these contestants that was competing to try to win this money. And they would have them to do some crazy things. Sometimes they'd have to do some kind of skyscraping, you know, stunt or something. And, but they all had to compete through a series of, a couple of series of different things. And I remember there was one part of the show that they'd always normally have to do, and they'd have to eat something disgusting. Like sometimes they would make them eat like six, five or six uh, hissing cockroaches. And they'd have to actually eat them, and they couldn't throw up. If you threw up, you lost. They had to hold it in. And I remember as a kid, I'm watching this show, you know, because I, I raised watching all kinds of different things on television. I'm watching the show as a kid, I'm going, oh, man. How many of you ever saw something disgusting like that, and it just makes you like, oh feeling sick to my stomach. I can't watch that. Turn the channel. Well, there's a few times that I had to do that. I was watch something. I'm just like, oh my goodness, I can't watch that. Or while you're even eating, you're like, oh man. You know, you start seeing them eat some kind of worms and you're eating spaghetti and you're like, ah. Oh. Right? Yeah, it's disgusting, right? Well, what, what goes into my mind, what went into my mind of me watching them eat that affected my stomach? And what you put into your stomach will affect your mind. How many of you have ever had McDonald's in your lifetime? Now, all right, let, let's narrow it down now. <laughs> how many of you have ever had a Big Mac in your lifetime? Okay. Yeah, now, how many of you know, you know this? You go to McDonald's and you eat that Big Mac, right? You grab that Big Mac and you eat it. And after eating it, you're just like, oh, oh. You just feel horrible, right? And you, like, you, just, you just want to take a nap. Maybe you feel that. Maybe you've ate something else. Maybe not a Big Mac, but you've ate something else. And you feel just like sluggish and horrible. What you put into your mouth and goes into your stomach will affect your mind. I remember I used to blame the reason why I couldn't ever understand algebra in school very well was because I had lunch right before algebra. And I would go and eat lunch, and I'd come and I'd sit in algebra class, and I'm just like, oh, oh man, I'm so full, I don't want to eat any, I don't want, I don't want to take in anything because my mind is shutting down. Are you with me? So, friends, if you put unhealthy things in your mind, that will literally affect your health and it will affect your mind and be numb and cloud your mind. How does God communicate with us again? Through our mind. So, friends, are you seeing the connection with this message? It is a connecting message in our salvation especially. If we put unhealthy things in our, in our mouth and it goes into our stomach, it can affect our mind. Let me, let me use a perfect example. Alcohol. Can you say Amen. When you drink a certain amount of alcohol, it will affect your mind to the point to where you now are not making proper decisions. Are you with me? Same thing happens with food, friends. There is certain unhealthful food that works the same way. You know, God found this subject to be so severe and so, so very pinpoint that He decided to place a very clear warning to us about this subject, about certain people that are eating unhealthful, abominable things in the last days. He has a warning for those that are eating these unhealthful things, and we need to heed this warning. In Isaiah 66, beginning in verse 15, it says, For behold, the Lord will come with what? Got a question. Did Jesus come with fire the first time? Yes or no? No. But the Bible tells us, we just read the scripture in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 8, that He will come with fire the second time. Isn't that right? So this is referencing the second coming of Jesus. It says, And with His chariots like a whirlwind... To render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. It says, For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Did we talk about how God's going to gather the, the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them? Yes, we talked about that. No doubt about it. That was the parable of the wheat and the tares. There will be a, 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 some slain of the Lord that will appear in the last days at Jesus' second coming. It, says, it goes on to say here, They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, and the what? What's that word? And the abomination. Friends, everything that was referred to as unclean in the Bible, God di directly links it to being an abomination. It says, and, and the abomination and the mouth shall be, what's that word? Consumed together, saith who? 
the Lord. So this is a warning God's giving us. And remember what we talked about consuming means. I just talked about it in question and answer time period. What does it mean to be consumed? You're gone, right? That's exactly what's going to happen to the wicked. They're going to burn up, friends. He's referring about him coming with fire. So this is referencing the second coming of Jesus. He's speaking directly of those that are in rebellion against his will, eating and doing and participating in certain things that are, are considered sinful in God's eyes. And what did we learn the other night? Malachi 3 and 6 says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Psalms 89 34 says, My covenant will I not break, nor will I alter the words that have gone out of my lips. And in Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So friends, does God change? No, so if he said that back in Isaiah's day, in reference to his second coming, does he still mean it today, yes or no? Yes. Now, I'm not trying to motivate anyone into fear, into obeying God, because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen? So we should never obey God out of fear, but we need to understand how important this message is to God and our salvation. Amen? Amen. Deuteronomy 14, beginning in verse 11, he gets on the clean birds now, the fowl of the air. He says, of all the clean birds you shall eat, but those you shall not eat, the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard. So here's a quick list of unclean bir birds here. The vulture, the buzzard, the red kite, the falcon. We have uh, the raven, the ostrich, the owl, the stork, the heron, and the bat. How many of you couldn't wait to get home and get you some good old bat tonight? <laughs> oh boy, I tell you what. We don't eat bat around here, but I know some people that do. I tell you, there's certain generations and certain people around the world that do eat it and they consider it a delicacy. Moving on, though, let's look at the uh, fish and the, uh, the things that move in the water, rather. He says, these you may eat of all that are in the what? The water. Whatever in the water has fins and, what's that word? Scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may what? Eat. So they have to have two things if they're going to be any part of the water. They have to have fins and they have to have scales. So, friends, if they don't have fins and they don't have scales, they're considered unclean. It goes on to say, But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are in what? An abomination. There it is again, connecting that word abomination. is an abomination to you. Friends, you know, some people, they wonder today, you know, there's many Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and you'll learn this as you spend time around uh, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters here at the church. Many Seventh-day Adventist Christians are vegans or vegetarians. Now, how many of you know the difference between a vegan and a vegetarian? Raise your hand if you do. Raise your hand if you don't know the difference between a vegan and a vegetarian. Okay, well, for those that are watching on camera who don't know the difference between a vegan and a vegetarian, a vegan is someone who, t who eats nothing of dairy products whatsoever. Can you say amen? They eat no dairy products whatsoever, but a vegetarian will eat some dairy products such as you know, milk or, or eggs or something like that, but they will not eat any meat, any flesh at all. Are you with me? So that's the difference between a vegan and vegetarian. Most Adventists are vegans and vegetarians because of this choice they've understood that it's a more healthful choice in making clearer decisions in your lifestyle with your relationship to Jesus. And friends, that's just proven. I tell you, when you eat a more vegan and vegetarian lifestyle, which was about, keep in mind, that was the vegan diet was a diet that was introduced in Eden. Can you say amen? That was the original diet that we should all be partaking of. Now we all struggle in getting there. I tell people sometimes I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> For years I've been a vegetarian trying to be vegan. <laughs> we, all, we all get there at different stages, no doubt. There was even a time before where I, I didn't think I'd ever be able to stop eating some of the unhealthy things that I ate. But friends, we can do all things through Jesus. Amen? who gives us strength, no doubt about it. You know, so a lot of people say, well, well, that's okay, I'll just eat clean meat. And we can eat clean meat, amen? There is clean meat that we can eat, but I want to warn you about participating in eating even some of the clean meat that's considered clean today. We have to still follow the principles of the Bible. Here's some, just an example I'm, I'm, I'm meaning. You know, the meat of today isn't the same meat in the Bible times. Did you know that? The reason why the meat has changed is because our companies like Tyson Chicken and some of these huge companies that make these meats nowadays, that what they're doing is that they're pumping steroids, they're, pump, they're shooting, they're getting these big old Goliath chickens. 
How many of you guys have seen this video? They get these huge Goliath chickens. They're like crippled and can't move, and many of them are diseased. And a lot of these chickens, they're, they're, they're abused and misused, and they're feeding on each other's feces of steroids and different things that are pumped into them throughout their life. They're, you know, they're stacked up on those trucks, and, and they get dropped down. All their feces get dropped down, and, and they don't have anything to eat for, for a certain amount of time. And so how they get them so big is they shoot them with these steroids. They get these big Goliath chickens. And then they send them out on the markets, and then that big old Goliath chicken leg, you and I eat that big old Goliath chicken leg, and then it creates us hormone problems. We get hormone problems and hormone issues. This is just scientifically proven. You can check some of this out. But our meat is not the same today. There is even meat, friends, that's being treated even today in the United States of America with carbon monoxide gas. Here's the difference between the meat. Check out these pig's picture here. Same piece of meat. This is before the carbon monoxide treatment. This is after the carbon monoxide treatment. They treated the same piece of meat. They wanted this meat. Nobody's going to buy this piece of meat in the market. Why? Because they're looking at it. It's too dark. It doesn't look fresh. But when somebody sees a nice piece of red meat, they're going, ah, that looks good. So they're allowed to treat it with carbon monoxide gas to make that meat appear more fresher. And I'm not, I'm not uh, lying to you here. You can just look this up on your own. Carbon monoxide is used in the USA to make meat appear fresher. This practice is banned in Canada, Japan, Singapore, and the European Union, but it's still being practiced in the United States of America. Friends, we have to be mindful of what we're putting into our mouth. Why? Because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Friends, if our minds are not clear... How in the world are we going to make clear decisions to give our life to Jesus on a daily basis? We have to have clear minds and clear hearts. Amen? And eating a healthier way will give us the ability to be able to think clearer and make clearer decisions. You know, this actually made it on ABC News called Pink Slime. I think it was back in the early uh, 2013, 2014, it made it on the news. It's Pink Slime, no doubt about it. You know, they use what they do is to get this meat all and what it is today. They use what's called meat glue. Uh, and I'm not trying to emphasize anything on gluten-free here. I'm just, this is just a picture I pulled offline just to emphasize kind of how it's used. And no, it's not real glue. This is just a picture here. It's not like glue that you would use as a child that they spray on this. What it is is like a powder. What you have here, they take meat that would be either, uh, a lot of the meat that would be scraps that you would throw out to the, dogs to eat or you would throw out to the you know possums to eat they take all these scraps off of these different animals and they they shave them off and they cut them off and they take what's called meat glue and it's like a powdery substance and they take it and they sprinkle it over that meat they grind it first together they'll grind up the meat in a grinder and they sprinkle it over that meat and then they form steak patties and, and different different things out of it whether it would be a steak a uh, 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 14-ounce ribeye or whatever it may be. They form things out of it so that they can sell it in the market and so that, that scraps can make them extra money. But the problem is this meat glue, again, is used to bind and absorb this meat together. And what do you think, if it's doing that to the meat, what do you think it's going to do to your arteries when it gets inside your system? It's going to clog up your arteries, isn't that right? And friends, that's exactly what's happening. And this is dangerous. And that's why a lot of the meat that we see today, and a lot of the meat that we eat today, it's not the same kind of meat that they would have ate in the Bible days. You know, there's also a principle a lot of people miss out on when consuming meat and eating certain things. In Leviticus chapter 3, beginning in verse 17, it says this, It shall be excuse me, a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither what? Fat nor blood. There's a reason why God specifically said, do not eat this throughout all your generations. It's because, friends, all the, the life of the animal is in the what? The blood. So if you're dealing with a diseased animal and you eat the blood, then that disease is henceforth transferred into you. Can you say amen? And now your body, your liver, your whole system has to try to break down and kill that disease off. And a lot of the times in the old days... They wouldn't be able to do it because they didn't have the modern medicine, different things that we have today to understand that, such as penicillin and different problems. And so check this out. It says, eat neither fat nor blood. The life of the animal was in the blood. And so if he was dealing with a diseased carcass, the blood was obviously contaminated. But what also he warned us of is the fat. Now the fat here 
all of the toxins that your body absorbs through deodorants and different things that you take, different, you know, you go out and you, you, uh, you're using your riding lawnmower, you, you're, you're soaking up all these different toxins throughout the air in your body, in your system, and then you, you, there's only mainly two ways that your body gets rid of toxins. You either sweat it out most of the time or you will get it out through your bowels. Those are the two ways that your body gets rid of a lot of the toxins. Now, the healthiest way to just get it out is through your bowels. But the situation is, is a lot of people don't exercise enough and they don't eat the right things to detox their body on the inside. So all of those toxins, and it does the same way with animals, all those toxins get stored in the fat chambers of the body. So where the fat is, that's where the toxins, all those toxic problems and those toxic things get stored in the fat. So when you eat the fat, you're ultimately eating the toxins of whatever that animal ate itself or absorbed itself in its body. Are you with me so far? It's all making sense? Amen. And so um, meat has definitely changed today. You know, even the Cancer Society warns of this. No red meat, and they even go as far as to mention alcohol here. Let me blow this up for you here, the first portion of this headline. It says, people should not eat any red meat or drink even moderate amounts of alcohol because of the risk of cancer, the American Cancer Society warns. So friends, this was back, I think, in the late 90s when they released this and made this very clear. But today, people are now being given recipes of unclean meat to eat. As, to, as for cancer patients and diabetic uh, people that are having diabetic issues, they're, they're giving them recipes and some of these uh, websites today to tell them to eat things that are unhealthful to them, that's actually aiding to their problem rather than reducing their problem. And friends, all kind of people have different ideas for why that's happening, but I'll tell you, at the end of the day, we need to educate ourselves on what we're putting into our mouths. Can you say amen? Amen. We need to educate ourselves. What about alcohol? Should a Christian be addicted or drink or partake of alcohol at all? No. But this is a debated... I can't even believe that this is a debated question among Christianity today. I have people all the time that come to me and they want to debate certain things that are just ridiculous ideas. I had one guy come up to me. He was a young kid. He was probably 19 years old. I was in Texas a few years ago. He came up to me. He's like, um, Mr. Day. And I was like, yeah, brother, what's up? He's like, he actually talked like this. He had like this voice, you know. And um, I said, yeah, brother, what's up? He said, um, I have a question, man. He's like, so you're saying that it's wrong to smoke, but like it's a plant. And I said, well, yeah, it's a plant. I said, but, you know. Are you eating the plant or are you smoking it? But it's a plant. I said, yeah, brother, I know it's, I understand it's a plant, but you know, you're not, your body's not meant to take in smoke into your body, take in toxins into your lungs directly. I said, it's not like you're eating the plant for a nutritional value or something. I said, certain plants have nutritional value and certain plants don't. I said, my goodness, if you look at certain plants, certain plants are poisonous, they can kill you. But are we going to rationalize and say it's okay to eat it just because it's poisonous? Just because it's a plant. No, not at all. And so I have some people come to me in Christianity. They say, well, what about alcohol? I mean, I see that Jesus turned the water into wine. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus turn that water into fermented wine or unfermented wine? He turned it into unfermented wine. Do you think Jesus is going to advocate a big party, advocate taking something into your temple, which is the Holy Spirit, and, and that alcohol, that fermented beverage, benumbing and clouding your mind to make you another person. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 20 and verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is what? Raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not what? Wise. Friends, I didn't say it. God did. If we're going to allow ourselves to be deceived by a beverage, then we are not wise in God's eyes. Now, here's the thing I want to point out. I had a guy come to me recently. He made mention of this and and I paint a little scenario for you for a moment. Let's say a guy goes, he has his friends inviting him out to the club to just have a beer. Just a beer. Hey, Bob, let's go out and let's have just one beer. Oh, I really need to get home to my wife. You know, she's going to be waiting on me. It's my birthday today. Oh, man, come on. Just one. Just one little beer. I ain't going to hurt you. And he says, oh, okay, sure. I guess we'll go. Just, we'll just have one. You know, one. You know, drink moderately, right? That's what some people think. And he gets there and... He has one beer with him. He's, all right, guys, I'm going to head out. Oh, man, come on, just have one more with us. 
Oh, well, I, I guess I'm here. I guess I'll have one more. And then I got to go have one more. And then by the time he's drunk another one, now it's done gotten in his system and it's done be, clou- be, be, uh, be clouded and benumbed his mind. And now this same Bob who, who, who wouldn't have made certain decisions begins to start making certain decisions that he wouldn't have made if he would have had his right mind. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I, I've seen drunk people. I've been around drunk people in my life. And I, they have either have one or two attitudes. Either they hate you and they're ready to fight you, or they love everyone. Tell me I'm wrong. That's the two attitudes of, of people that become beclouded and benumbed. Either they want to fight everyone, they want to show everybody how, how angry and how mad and how tough and rough they are, or they want to love everyone. I had family members that would get drunk and they'd come up to me. I hadn't seen them in six years. And they'd come up by the house, hey, they called, man, I sure do love you, man. And I'd just smile and say, I love you too, brother. <laughs> and, and then I'd have some of them, boy, they'd get angry. They'd come by wanting to fight and different things. Let me tell you, friends, this mindset is not of God. Can you say amen? You see, wine in the Bible, that's one of those words that takes on a different meaning in our society today. Wine in the Bible had two meanings, either strong drink, which was a, ferment, uh, a fermented beverage, or an unfermented meaning, which would be fresh grape juice. Are you with me? Unfermented wine would be fresh grape juice. But in the Bible days, it held the same type of meaning there. You had oinos and the new oinos, which was new wine. New wine would be the fresh grape juice. But in our society today, when we hear the word wine, we think fermented beverage. Isn't that right? And so some people read where Jesus turned the water into wine, and they want to advocate drinking and having, taking all these things in. Friends, don't fall into that deception. Jesus does not advocate nowhere in the Bible for us to take in something that is that harmful to our mind to cause us to become another person. So Bob has a couple beers. And uh, now Bob has went down to a nightclub that he shouldn't have went to, done things with a lady that he shouldn't have done things with. And now he has cheated and he has committed adultery. And now he's driving home back to his wife and his children late at night his mind is clouded and benumbed, and he can't see the, 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 the sides of the road very well. And he scoots off the road, and he hits a family that was driving in a minivan. And you can make up the rest in your mind. A horrible scenario, all because of something that benumbed and clouded the mind. Can you see what I'm talking about, friends? God does not advocate such things. So let us not to try to make excuse for them. You know, in Ezekiel 22, beginning in verse 26, it says, Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. This is God speaking, speaking of the people that rationalized the evil things in the day. He says, They have put no difference between the what? Holy and the profane. He says, Neither have they showed difference between the unclean, there it is, and the clean. He's saying these people would show no difference between what God has as quickly and very clearly established a difference to. He said, and they have hid their eyes, there it is, from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Friends, God's word is clear, very clear on this issue, that these people in Ezekiel's day did not make and establish a difference between clean and unclean, between holy and profane. And you know what God ended up doing to those people? He ended up giving them over into the hand of a heathen king. He said, you want that lifestyle? I will, let, I will allow you to have that lifestyle. God will give us what we want. He will allow us to be taken over to what we want if we continue to rebel against Him. Amen? That's what He did with Israel all over throughout the Bible. Friends, let us seek to please God. Let us seek to follow His Word. Amen? That we will not become heathen before His eyes. In Daniel chapter 1, we read a story in Daniel chapter 1 of... Uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and then Daniel coming before the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. And they were offered the king's meat in Daniel chapter 1, which was the king's food. That's what meat means in the Bible, food. And uh, they saw the king's meat, that it was unfit for consumption. And they said, no, we don't want a portion of the king's meat, but just give us pulse that we may eat. Which is basically like a, 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 good, a good diet of fruits and vegetables, the original diet that would have been given in Eden. They said, you just give us that. And, and give us water to drink, and test us ten days. Try us ten days to see whether or not we look fairer by, by, by uh, our, 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 our bodies and how we look. See if we look fairer than the other people that are eating the king's portion. And so the man gave them ten days, and ten days later, 
they looked better. The Bible says they looked ten times better. Some versions say they looked ten times wiser than all of the other men that were eating of the portion of the king's food. Friends, how many of you want to be ten times better? Amen? Well, if you follow Jesus' diet, amen? Follow the Bible, that is the, the diet that He laid out in the Bible. Friends, we will, we will be okay. We will be in, 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 a, in a better physical, mental, and spiritual state. No doubt about it. So there's three diets in the Bible that you can choose from. You have the acceptable, which is a clean meat diet, no doubt. But keep in mind, today, it's not really that clean. If you eat it according to how most people would eat it, going by your local McDonald's or, or whatever, most of that meat isn't clean, friends. So if you're going to eat it, if you're going to eat meat, I would highly encourage you to eat organic, grass-fed meat and things like that. Amen? If you're going to eat it, make sure you eat neither fat nor blood. It doesn't need to be having any blood with it. It needs to be kosher. It's a long process. And so, friends, that's the, that's the biblical way. Follow Leviticus there when it says that in chapter 3. So there's the acceptable, no doubt. And then there's the unacceptable, the unclean meats of the Bible. And then there's the ideal diet. Amen. That's the diet that we want to strive for. Can you say amen? Amen. Now, are you, are, some people say, well, Dakota, are you telling me it's a sin to eat meat? I didn't say that. Amen? I did not say it was a sin to eat meat. But what I'm telling you, friends, is that we need to be making healthful, healthful decisions that will lead us and guide us and be prepared for heaven. What did Jesus command us to pray? He said that we will do it. He said, he said, we pray, thy will be done, in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is where? In heaven. Are we going to be, are we going to be in heaven and go, oh man, look at that crocodile right there. Oh man. And then pounce on that crocodile and kill it. Are we going to do that and then eat it? Do this right here. No. We're not going to be doing that in heaven. There's going to be no death in heaven. I heard one minister say, he said, when the cows get into heaven and the chickens get into heaven, they're going to say, praise God. No more death for them. No more slaughtering for them. No doubt about it. They get to live peacefully. And so, friends, if that's what we're going to be eating in heaven, then why don't we get used to it now? Amen? Amen. Amen. That, that's all I'm saying. Now, a lot of people say, but what about Acts chapter 10? Acts chapter 10, we see this sheet descending down, and uh, God, God tells Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And it's all kinds of these unclean beasts. Turn your Bible to Acts chapter 10 real quick. Let's go there real quick in our Bibles. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, and let's, let's see here. So Peter goes up on the housetop, and he's basically, you know, pondering and thinking about his day. And he become to be very hungry. We see this in verse 10. He become to be very, very hungry, and he would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a what? A trance, according to verse 10. Chapter 10, verse 10 of Acts. Then verse 11, it says, And I saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been great sheet, knit at the four corners, and led down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. So, there's all kinds of manner of beasts in here. Creeping things, wild beasts, and it says, and fowls of the air. Now, we know the majority of the fowls of the air are unclean. Isn't that right? Yes, so people would say, yeah, these are unclean animals right here. It says here, And there came a voice to him, in verse 13, saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Verse 15, And the voice spake unto him, and again the second time, What God hath cleansed, thou call not, th call not thou common. And they want to stop right there, and they want to say, Right there, Dakota. Your clean and unclean message and your idea of following the laws of the Bible of the clean and unclean meats doesn't apply because they're telling, God's telling Peter that, hey, what I have cleansed in these animals, don't you dare call common or unclean because I've cleaned them. I, I, I've cleansed them. Now, that's what we would get if we stopped right there. But should we stop or should we continue reading? I think we should continue reading. So God tells him, what God hath cleansed, thou call not thou common. This was done three times and a vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what, uh, what this vision was, he had seen what, what, he had, what it should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made an inquiry of Simon's house and stood before the gate. So you've got to get the backstory on this. Cornelius, who was, by the way, what nationality was Cornelius? Roman. He was a Roman soldier. Cornelius had heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ and was beginning to believe and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the problem was, he was a Roman. 
And Romans were looked at, all the, anybody that was not a Jew was considered a what? A Gentile and was also considered unclean in the eyes of every Jew. Which Peter was a, a Jew, raised up in the traditions of the Jews. And so he believed that men and women that were not a Jew was common and unclean and not, wasn't supposed to associate with them. So here's the problem. God had told the disciples, Go ye therefore, in Matthew chapter 28, baptizing all of them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them all things that I have commanded you. And He commanded them, that gave them the Great Commission, did He not? Preach the gospel to all of them. How are they supposed to preach the gospel to all of the world if they believe that salvation is only of the Jews? Can you say amen? So now, Cornelius is starting to believe the gospel, accept the gospel, you see in, in the chapter before, chapter 10. And now, God has told them to send for Peter that they may create a meeting, create a, a meeting place that they can come and talk about this. So check this out. When you go down to verse, let's see, let's go down to verse... Um, let's go down to verse uh, 25. And as Peter was coming in, so now they're about to come in and they're about to meet, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. Now Peter was trying to figure out what that dream meant. It says that up there afterwards. But Peter doubted in himself what this vision was which he had seen, should mean. He was trying to figure out, God, what are you trying to tell me? Are you trying to tell me I can eat whatever I want now? But now he sees this connection with Cornelius coming in. Cornelius is a Roman. He's dealing with Romans now, Gentiles. It says, he, as he talked with him, in verse 27, he went in and found many that were come together, and he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful thing for a man that is a what? Jew to keep company or come unto one of another of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any animal common or unclean. Is that what it says? Look at your Bibles. It says, God hath showed me that I should call no man common or unclean. Can you say amen? Friends, this is what God was trying to tell Peter with this vision. He was not telling Peter he can eat whatever he wants to eat now, that everything's lawful to eat, as some people teach. If that's the case, then God changes when God said, I change not. So that would make God a liar. Do we serve a God that is a liar? No. So if God said it over here that it's unclean, you could bet that it's still unclean. Amen? How many of you, if I presented to you a nice, beautiful, green, luscious salad, how many of you would like to partake of that salad? Amen? Yeah? And so I get this salad, and I, I say, oh, Brother Wes, you, you be the first one, brother, to take part of this salad. And, and as I'm about to hand it to Brother Wes, I drop it in the floor, and I fall over it, and dirt gets all over the salad, and all oh, there's crumbs, and now the ants are starting to get onto it. And I say, it's okay, five-second rule. And I start picking this salad up and putting it in the bowl, and I say, okay, Brother Wes, you go right on ahead, brother. Get you some of that salad. Now, Brother Wes, is that an unclean salad or a clean salad now? It's unclean to him. Are you with me? None of us would go, mmm, yum. I want some of that salad now. Bring it my way. We're looking at that salad. We're going, uh, no. Nah. Ants and dirt. No, nah, we're good. Right? So here's the thing. If God called it unclean, is it still unclean? Yes. So friends, let's not try to rationalize what God has called unclean and say, oh, it's clean now. Our God does not change. Now the next one that I would present to you in closing is this. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to present 1 Timothy 4 another time. Because that's a little take, take a little bit more time for me to go into. But I'll, I'll deal with that in a question and answer time. My wife's going to write that down now for us. But friends, there's many things that we can partake of that's harmful. Can you say amen? And we all know that. I'm just going and covering some things that a lot of people don't think about. You know, there's even things that our doctors can give us that are harmful and unhealthful. Amen? Is that true? Yes. Just because your doctor gives you something don't mean it's necessarily helpful to you. Here's why I say that. Because did you know that the majority of doctors are not trained in nutrition? Did you know that? Do your research. They're trained in medicine. They know what medicines do. 
They're trained in the medical field of doing different surgeries and procedures and trained in medications. That's what our world has come to. If you have an ill, let me prescribe you a pill. Are you with me? But here's the thing. like You have a pain. If you have a headache and you take a pill, that pill is only going to numb your pain. Are you with me? You still have a headache. You just can't feel it anymore. Isn't that right? That's how it works. And praise God for that. Amen. I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm saying that's good that we have pain medication that can help us with certain unbearable pain that we don't understand why it's happening. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But when we can't pronounce, have mercy, half of the things that, are, that is within those things, then we should probably think about what we're putting in our mouth. Can you say amen? And I tell you, you, you go and look at the medication you're taking, different things that you may be taking. You'll find out that if you can't pronounce half of it, you don't even know what it's doing. You don't even know what that substance may be doing to your body. It may be benumbing, and most of it benumbs and clouds our minds, even certain medications today. Now, I'm not telling you you can't take medications prescribed to you from your doctor. No, I did not say that. All I'm saying, friends, is that we need to be mindful of what we're putting into our mouth. Amen? Even from our doctor, when their doctor might prescribe something. And I was watching, um, I think it was a, like a, a Latuta or a Cymbalta commercial. How many of you guys have seen those Latuta commercials and Cymbalta commercials on television? Two people? Okay. Three people? Okay, I got you, you guys know what I'm talking about, man. It was a, some kind of depression medication. And um, it's supposed to keep you from depression. And I, I'm not kidding. At the end of the commercial, it sounded just like this. May cause depression, insomnia, diarrhea, ulcers, fatigue, nightmares, nausea, anemia, vomiting, headaches, addiction, anxiety, or death. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. Like, literally, you have that, like, Speedy Gonzalez right there at the end of the commercial that will real quickly say all these things. I mean, it'll be like in super speed mode, depression, insomnia, diarrhea, it's ulcers, fatigue. And you know, you'll hear it right there at the end of the commercial, and you're just like, what? It's supposed to help me with depression, but it may cause depression? And, and, and insomnia and diarrhea and all these things, and you're just like, what? If it may cause all these things, even death, why would you even want to take the risk? But you check it out at the end of those commercials. They actually put these, this information on there. Friends, the Bible's clear. We need to fear God and give glory to Him. Amen? And the Bible says, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, give glory to God. Friends, you can give glory to God by what you put, th what, what, the things you put in your mouth. So be sure, next time you ask yourself what you put in your mouth, ask yourself, is it giving glory to God? And if it's not, ask God that He will give you a heart change and a taste bud change and a mind change, that He will help you to hate those things that are harmful to you and help you to love those things that are good for you. Amen? Amen. I had a good friend of mine, Danny Vieira. He, um, he had a guy walk into his office one day. He's a health specialist, Danny Vieira. He was. He is uh, deceased now. He was a good friend of mine. He passed on. But he had a guy walk into his office one day. Guy walks in and he says, um, Danny. And Danny says, yeah, yeah. I said, Come on in. He said, well, hold on. before I walk in, he said, I need to tell you. He said, they sent me to you. Danny says, they, he said, who sent you to me? He says, my doctors, they sent me to you. He said, oh, well, how can I help you? He said, well, uh, he said, I got, I got uh, emphysema. I got, I got lung cancer. And the guy said, oh, Danny said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. He said, well, uh, why don't you come in and sit down and I'll, I'll see what we can do for you to help you out. And uh, the guy said, ah, he said, hold on a second. He said, you need to know something about me. Then he said, okay, well, what is it? He said, I smoke. And then he smiles. He said, okay. He says, you smoke. He said, okay. He said, well, he said, do you plan on? He said, that's the thing. He said, that's, what I, that's why I'm not sitting down just yet. He said, I smoke and I'm not giving it up. What is Danny to do? Danny says to him, he says, hey, man, he, I can't help you. He said, you can leave. He said, I can't help you. He said, what? Then he says, I mean, do you not see what you're saying? And he goes, I thought you were a Christian. He said, they told me you were a Christian, Danny. Then he said, you know what? I am a Christian. I love the Lord. He said, see, that's the thing with you Christians. He said, you Christians, you just, you're not free. You're not free to do what you want to do. You're not free to, to live and have fun and go about your being. Then he says, what now? 
He says, yeah, you can't smoke if you want to smoke. You can't drink if you want to drink. You just can't have no fun. He says, you're just not free. Then he says, I tell you what. He says, bring me your package of cigarettes. And the guy looks at him like, really? For real? Then he says, bring me your package of cigarettes. Bring me your lighter. So Danny takes a cigarette out, puts it in his lips. He takes the lighter. He strikes the lighter. He holds the flame right next to the cigarette. He says to the guy, I can start smoking right now. Nothing in the world is keeping me from starting right now. He said, Now, you stop smoking right now. Who's free? Who's free? Friends, we all have addictions of some sort, amen? We all got problems with something. And if you don't think you do, go to God and get alone with Him. He'll share with you what problems you have. Although that addiction may seem impossible to overcome, Jesus Christ can give you the victory over every addiction in your life. If you will look unto Him. Amen? Stand with me if that's your desire tonight. You say, I want to overcome through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends, Jesus Christ is coming again. We need to be ready for His soon appearing. Amen? And mind and heart and physical, everything about our, ourselves need to be prepared for Him. So let's pray. Let's ask Jesus to help prepare our, all of our hearts and our minds so that when He comes on that great and glorious day, we will be ready. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for Your love. Father, we talked about some hard things this, this afternoon. We discussed some very difficult situations in our, in our lives and different things that many of us are addicted to, sugar and, oh Lord, many of us probably have diabetes and issues and problems and struggles, but God, we know you're greater than all of those things. We know, Lord, that you can give us the true victory over all of those things. And God, we want to claim your promise right now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you will help us to overcome these unhealthful practices, Lord, that is benumbing and clouding our minds. God, help us to give it all up to you. Father, you said that if we ask anything, that it will be done if we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus. So, Father, we ask and plead with you now. Change our minds. Change our hearts. Lord, change our taste buds. Help us to hate the sinful and abominable thing and to love you and the healthful things. We thank you and we love you. And we ask you all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.